Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Cheryl Jennison de Proza, and today I'm joined by Chris Lyons and Paul Gunia, and they're going to talk us through Intellimix and how it delivers consistent meeting audio room, meeting room audio, excuse me. Uh, but before we get into that, just a few items of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing. Um, please be patient. It usually takes us about a week or so to get it edited, um, but after about a week, it should be available for viewing at any time, and you can find it at sure.com slash webinars. Um, we also have all of our other past webinars archive there. So there's a lot of great sessions across a lot of great audio topics. So please feel free to go peruse, see all of our great past webinars. Once again, that's sure.com slash webinars. Second of all, as we go through the session today, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into us. Um, to find the question section, just look for on that gray toolbar, look for that little speech bubble with a question mark on it and click on it and you should be able to access the question section. Um, ask as many questions as you have, but please note that we will be holding on questions until the end of the session. So type in your questions, be patient, and we will get to them at the end. All right, I think that wraps up all the housekeeping. Let's get into the good stuff. Take it away, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Cheryl. And Paul, thanks for joining us here on the webinar. Uh, thanks for having me. This is actually my first webinar. Never done this before. We'll try not, to make, it, we'll try not to make it too hard on you, okay? We'll try to go Thank easy you. on you. Um, I always like to tell people that the room is part of the sound system. I think they forget that. The room has a big impact on what kind of results you get. And nowhere is that more of an issue in meeting rooms. And Sure has had a long history of creating products that get used in meeting rooms and for tele teleconferencing and so forth. This, this is fitting that we're talking about this now because we've got, in the last several years, lots of new products aimed at this market. So I thought let's start out by just talking a little bit about the room and why is the room a factor. Here's a nice picture of a room here just down the hall from us at uh, Sure Chicago headquarters. And you know it's it's a very nice room and it's a good sounding room but it still has a lot of the features that you find in a lot of people's meeting rooms today, don't you? Yes, yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this because it becomes a, a big issue. Um, I think there's a lot of um, importance placed upon um, aesthetics these days, architecture. How does the room look, right? Uh, it's the facilities people that are uh, defining what the room is made out of, the construction of them, and it has a huge impact on the acoustics, right? All these hard surfaces, glass walls, whiteboards, right? We all love to write on run on walls. It feels like you're a little kid again, and <laughs> you get all your ideas out. You can draw some pretty pictures. Uh, but it, it is a great way to be productive in meetings, uh, but it causes a lot of audio problems. Right. And a lot of those decisions about architecture and interior design get made ahead of AV and IT well infrastructure. Well and so before. by the time the AV person gets involved or a systems integrator, it's largely the case of, well, this is the way it's going to be. Exactly. You they know? get handed this mess and told to clean it up. Right. Exactly. And the mess can consist of a variety of different things. It might be, in some rooms, room noise. A lot of rooms, especially in older buildings, have a lot of HVAC noise or, you know, just uh, building equipment rumbled coming through walls and mm -hmm. things like that. And uh, reverberation, you know, like you mentioned, whiteboards. Um, glass walls are now the thing. And it seems like every new conference room has at least one wall of glass. Um, which is, of course, enormously reflective to sound. But it looks great. It does look great, yeah, and it you know keeps a lot of light in the room and yeah. things like that. So it's it's nice. Um, the ones that I love are the the ones where it's sort of like an entrepreneurial startup company, mm -hmm. and it's like all concrete floors. Yep. You know, like they wanted it to feel like it's like an old garage or a service station we or something. We kind of refer to that as California cool. Mm hmm. Yes, but. <laughs> Unfortunately, if your office looks like an abandoned warehouse, it probably sounds like an abandoned yeah, warehouse too. Real reverberant, you sound like you're, uh, you know, at the bottom of a cave or something. Yep, exactly. And and even if you've got a good room, people are still people, and that means that you know you've got people do you know leaning back from the microphone sometimes like this, and you know moving around or just everybody talks at different levels. So all those things have to somehow be controlled. Yeah, and, and that also speaks to uh, a bit of the audio coverage of your microphones as well, right? When you have a, right. a, a bigger space, you're going to need more consistent uh, audio pickup 
uh, from one end of the table to the other. If someone's at the whiteboard, if someone's right in front of that display, right, mm-hmm. they're kind of going to be different distances uh, from those microphones. Right. And Cheryl, you're a professional singer, you know, sometimes. Mm-hmm. And you, <laughs> I don't mean you're only professional sometimes. I mean, you know, you come here sometimes too. Sure. Uh, but part of your job is to make sure the microphone is in the right place of all course. the time. Yeah. But if if I'm here in a meeting, I'm here because of some other reason. My job is not to make sure that I'm in front of the microphone in the perfect position. Correct. Yes. You know, the, I'm here. The microphone's there, and it is what it is. Mm-hmm. So and and you know, we also just can't assume that uh, you know John from operations and Kate from finance will know. All those skills that uh, Cheryl has picked up over the years of microphone technique. Right. Knowing knowing how to keep it in exactly the sweet spot and control her voice. Yeah. Right. That, we we, that we doesn't got to think happen. about the, the average uh, conference room user, right? The people that don't know about audio, the people that want to come into the room, start their meeting, and be uh, productive in that meeting. Right. Have, have a normal conversation without, um, you know, trying very, very hard just to hear the person. Uh, they want to get their business done. Well, that's why they invited me to this webinar, because I am the lowest common denominator. I represent that entry-level user who can't figure anything out. We've got these audio problems that we've we've got to deal with. The other thing that's that's a phenomenon nowadays is a lot of people are doing video conferences just from their desktop. You know, they're doing it on a laptop in their cubicle or in their office, and it's usually, it's a solo thing, typically. Mm-hmm. You know, once in a while, you might have another person join in and they just get in front of the, the computer with you. Um, but most laptop or, or desktop systems can pretty easily pick up two people if they're yeah, in the right spot. Um, th- this is a great point and it's actually uh, super interesting to see what's happening in this space and that there's almost this big shift of these uh, consumer type workflows coming in to the enterprise, coming into the business, right? Everyone has uh, iPhones, everyone has uh, these little, um, you know, video conferencing machines in their pocket, you hit one button and boom, you're on a, a, a video conference, right? It's not like the old days of these big complicated systems anymore. Um, and as uh, the, the workforce is, is getting younger, sorry to, sorry to say, Chris, but the workforce is getting younger, <laughs> um, they, they expect some of these workflows to follow them into the enterprise, right? So, so, so they want these easy workflows and they're using uh, these services that were designed for those personal assets, right? The personal asset of a cell phone, of a laptop. And then once you start trying to stretch that, that same workflow, that same experience to the conference room, uh, it, it frankly just starts breaking down. Right, exactly. Because as soon as you get more than a couple of people, now all of a sudden the the one microphone approach just breaks down. It doesn't, doesn't work. work. People can't hear well enough through the loudspeaker. People can't be picked up well enough through the microphone. So you, you get a table full of people and now you need a completely different solution. And that's one thing that we've been doing for a long time. And when you've got multiple participants, you need multiple microphones. Correct. But that opens up a whole other basket of, of problems because every open microphone, in addition to picking up voice, is also picking up some room noise sure to whatever does. degree it's there, some reverberation. And so that can detract from the sound quality uh, in some cases more than having more microphones closer to people adds to the sound quality. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we, we've seen mixing microphones um, is kind of hard. Um, you know, we've <laughs> thank God we've been doing it for so long, but uh, it's, it's kind of tricky. And uh, the, the, the bigger the room is, the more people that are going to be in that room, the more microphones you're going to need. And that just compounds that problem. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. So uh, one of the best ways, since there's no you know sound engineer in a meeting, there's nobody sitting at the side of the room you operating. Don't, you don't the hire a guy to do your meeting. No. <laughs> if only Cheryl could be in every uh, meeting, right. just you know watching the levels and everything. I'm a horrible sound engineer. I'm a singer, not an engineer. <laughs> That's a good point. I hadn't thought of it. You're not usually on the, the knob side of the mixer. Definitely not. No. 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 Um, well, we've been doing this for quite a while, and the interesting thing is that uh, automatic mixing is is sort of the de facto solution for how do you activate the microphones without a person to do it for you and without making everybody push a button. Uh, and there should be some little icons are there. Oh, there they are. Oh, okay. And we've got a couple of lobes there like that. 
So the, the question comes down to how do you make this work? I mean, it, it sounds simple and lots of people have tried their own homebrew solutions to this, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, I'll get some noise gates and blah, 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 and yep. put them all together. It just isn't easy. Right. The, the key to automatic mixing um, is is really turning on, um, you know, only one microphone for one talker, right? So if, if I'm talking in that conference room, I want the best microphone, or in this case, uh, kind of the lobe of that uh, ceiling array microphone, uh, to be uh, opened only for my voice, right? If, if, if I'm talking in there and multiple lobes are opening up, the wrong lobe is opening up, you're, you're hearing more of the room than you are of my voice, right? You're hearing a lot more of those uh, reflections in that room off those glass walls we were talking about, right? Uh, these, these architects are great in uh, producing these echo chambers. And I, I start talking in a room and all of a sudden my voice is bouncing off a few different uh, surfaces uh, and they're all time delayed. And thus some uh, automatic mixers really don't know where I am in space, right? They think I'm on this side of the table. I'm on that side of the table at the same time. I'm super fast. Right. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of warping around the, the, the table in milliseconds. Uh, but our automatic mixers is actually smart enough to know uh, that it only opens up one channel uh, for my voice. Right. And by the same token, the mixer has to be smart enough to not be fooled when uh, it picks up reflections of that one talker at other microphones or lobes. But it has to be open to the idea that there might be a second talker. Because if, what if, what if two people are talking? The mixer's got to know, oh, this is actually somebody else. And I need to open lobe number four for that person on the other side of the table. Right. It would, it would make things so much easier if everyone was just very polite and waited for everybody <laughs> to finish talking and please finish your thoughts. And then I might, uh, you know, contribute my thoughts on, on, on the meeting as well. But, as, as we've seen, meeting culture uh, doesn't necessarily allow you to do that. Right. So having multiple talkers, uh, multiple microphones open, and having that be a clean signal, uh, as we said, is, is quite a challenge. Right. And one of the products I spend a lot of time working with here is Microflex Complete, sure. which is for formal meetings where right. people, there is more of a system, an order to the speaking. People are waiting their turn. You're pushing a button and saying, I want to be next and yep. that kind of thing. But automatic mixing works much better in a more dynamic, more fluid kind of a situation. Exactly. It's much less formal. Uh, there's no uh, kind of user interaction to it, right? Everyone just talks and the idea is it all just goes through and it's nice and clean, noise free, um, without having people to, um, you know, indicate when they want to speak. There's no real right. user um, interaction to having to do that. Now, in in the early days when when we were uh, selling automatic mixers, the typical scenario was you had maybe eight boundary mics or eight gooseneck mics or something around a table. So that gives you, uh, from the mixer's perspective, that gives you a lot of data to work with yes. on how to make that gating decision. How's that different now that we're talking about array microphones? It is drastically different, <laughs> and it's unfortunately a heck of a lot harder. Uh, so um, I'm kind of jealous of those guys that were making those products back then because they, they had some more information at hand, right? Um, and the big piece there was uh, time of arrival, we call it. So basically, if you have a uh, – think of a, a long table and a, and a row of – boundary microphones or gooseneck microphones, if I'm at one end of the table and I start speaking, there's actually a time difference to when my voice hits the closest microphone to me, for example, from the furthest microphone from me. And you could use some of that time information now to say, oh, it hit microphone one first. I'm going to turn that on. Even though I see that same signal at microphone eight, it's already on, you know, microphone one and it got there first. That must be the best microphone. Uh, with the Ray microphones, it's drastically different. We don't have all that time information because all those capsules are at the same point in space, right? So the MXA 910 has over 100 microphone capsules in it, and my voice hits all those capsules at the same exact time. Right. So time if of multiple is non-existent, and anymore. if multiple people talk, all those voices are hitting the mic at essentially the same time. Exactly. Exactly. So we need to play a lot more tricks under the hood, and you know. I might blow your mind a little bit with it, so I, I don't want to go into too many of those details. Does it involve impedance or voltage or anything like that? I can't say. Okay. Can't say. <laughs> but I'm doing it to protect you. Good, good. Yeah, I He'd just... tell you, but he might have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> just give me the short version of the brochure. That's all I can understand. It just works. Yeah, Chris. that's all I want to know. It just works. I talk, it, works. it works, people hear me, that's all I want to know. 
Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the Sure products that we've uh, done with automatic mixing in them over the years. Um, this one's near and dear to my heart because <laughs> when I first started at Sure, this was a hot seller, the AMS automatic microphone system. And this was kind of a, a very unique approach mm -hmm. to automatic mixing. So uh, what was what was special about this? Well, what was special was it was really the first product to do automatic mixing without hiring a sound guy, right? It was it was having a a computer, a machine, be the sound guy for you in the room, right? Which was kind of new and a breakthrough. Uh, what's what's interesting about this, and and I think we're going to go into this a bit, is how um, it had proprietary microphones. Right. You can only use the AMS microphone with the AMS system. It had a special <laughs> connector. Um, right. We, we we had to really control the whole environment for yep. it to work properly. Yep. It was the closed the closed system type yep. of thing. The the great thing was it looked like a mixer. It felt like a mixer. You you set the controls just like a regular mixer. But all the magic was on the inside. But you did have to use these special microphones that had Correct. two capsules in them. I'm surprised you went there. I'm surprised you gave away that secret sauce. Well, it's you know it's not so secret anymore. Ah, we've it is we've moved on. Thirty six so, years old. Right. Exactly. But so the 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 algorithm, if you want to be technical, was so the front mic and the back mic. The front mic heard the talker. The back mic heard the the room noise. The mixer compared the two, and if the front mic was significantly louder than the back mic, then it knew, ah, somebody must be talking at me, yep. turn that channel on. Wow. And it actually worked extremely well. Yeah. Were you yeah. An, an engineer on that project? You seem to know a lot about it. Well, no, I just memorized the user guide. Uh. <laughs> And so that that turned out really well. There was also another version of that called the ST6000, which was Sure Teleconferencing Mixer, mm -hmm. that was pretty much the same uh, concept, but it also had some um, phone jacks, telephone jacks, analog phone line jacks on it, so that you could connect it to a phone line for audio conferences. So the AMS model was typically used in, you know, a sound reinforcement situation, maybe in a, you know, a meeting room, a large meeting room or a training room or something, and then the ST version would be for audio conferencing. Right. And and it was expensive too. It was not a cheap product. I mean, thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, but of course, the one drawback to you got to use this microphone is there was always some reason why somebody needed to use a sp specific type of mic or a certain appearance of mic or maybe a wireless mic. So that became. It, it sounds like you've worked with Cheryl before. <laughs> <laughs> she has she has very high mic requirements. I do. <laughs> But I have an in. <laughs> <laughs> she knows somebody at the factory. I do. Um, so that became something of a limitation. So there was a desire to open that up and give people more options. And believe it or not, the first product that we did uh, that addressed that was a portable version for uh, broadcasters and field production who said, you know, when I'm doing like 60 minute style interviews and things like that in the field, it would be great to have automatic microphones, but I've got to use these little lavalier mics that look good on camera. Maybe they're wireless and so forth. So we developed a new style of gating called type two gating that did not rely on special microphones. You could use whatever mic you want and would still activate the channels reliably. Yeah, and that was a huge step in this in this timeline. I think you're going into here about about opening it up to any microphone, even you know the the microphone Cheryl want to use, and having that be uh, just a standard XLR or three pin connector. Yep. Um, any standard microphone can now be automatically mixed. Was was a big deal. Yep. And of course, that didn't stop there. It, it, there was a teleconferencing version. There was, um, you know, it got into other formats of products. Like uh, a lot of people may not know this, Sure used to make tabletop uh, teleconferencing units, you know, similar to a Polycom. We had the ST3500. We even had one prior to that called the ST3000. Um, you know, these were like the, the Frisbee style things that sit on the table. The 3500 actually had automatic mixing built into yeah. it so that it, it only activated the mic that was on the side of the, the talker around the table. And that worked out really nicely. Have you ever seen the version that's in like a walnut wood grain? Yeah. It is a darn good looking speakerphone. Oh, yeah. That's the 3000. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That was a very nice sounding Man, product. It's gorgeous. Um, and then in the mid-90s and late 90s, we expanded this Type 2 gating into a bunch of other mixers. So there was an SCM810, which was sort of a rack mount version of the, four, the FP410. 
uh, for, you know, uh, it stood for sound contractor mixer for installed situations. Um, and it also had logic connections. And that was really important. We learned that from the AMS model that there were lots of situations where somebody would say, well, I need one microphone to be live all the time. Mm -hmm. Or when this microphone goes live, I need it to take precedence over that microphone. And um, and and that became uh, something that was uh, a lot of special installations relied on those logic applications like that. Logic, yeah, I, I agree, is also a, a big breakthrough. And what that um, did was give people a bit more indication and a bit more control. Right. Right. It allowed people to press a button to push a talk or push to mute. It, it told people, is the microphone on? Is the microphone off? And those just little things, right? It sounds, it sounds very minor, but it has a big, um, kind of impact on the meeting on your use case. Right. Another real big, uh, application for that was, um, uh, systems like in a training room or a distance learning classroom where you wanted cameras to automatically switch sure. in response to which microphone was active. Exactly. And so the, these, most of these mixers had logic outputs that would basically send that signal to a video switcher and say, Hey, mic three is on now. Mic six is on now. Yep. So that the switcher knew, Oh, okay. This camera, that camera, you know, Big, you know, the distant camera, the close camera, whatever. Yeah, and uh, camera control continues to be a big use case, especially uh, I see it a lot in some education use cases mm -hmm. where you kind of have a uh, professor, a presenter, and you have a camera on them. But then when someone in the audience and in the student section wants to ask a question, right, you want to see them on camera. So these distance learning type applications, these recording of lectures, uh, it's, it's a big use case there as well Right to this day. Um, now, then in 2013, we made uh, a big jump. We basically took that automatic mixing algorithm uh, that was called Intellimix at this point um, and said, okay, this needs to be digital because... This you, is more than a big jump, Chris. Well, it, it, was a big, it was a big jump for me, but I didn't have to do any of it. Ah, so. you weren't a developer on that. On no, that no, 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 AMS. no. They, I, they didn't let me in there, no. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, so bringing it into the <clears throat> digital realm uh huge right i mean um the the impact that this has uh, on the rest of our portfolio uh you know we're we're still feeling those impacts today it gives us so much more flexibility so much more freedom of where uh these algorithms live and what we can do with them right and taking that complex decision process of which mic and which mic not and you know converting it from analog voltages and circuits and that sort of thing and saying, no, now it's got to be lines of code yep. uh, that can run on a, on a, you know, a digital mixing platform. But that brought a lot of benefits because you got more flexibility, right? Oh, sure. You could tweak to your heart's content with the SCMA 20. I mean, you, you can open up uh, that, that box, that, that web-based uh, user interface today, and you could tweak more parameters than I can frankly remember. Yep. Um, there's, there's knobs and levers all over that. And it really lets you uh, tweak and tune in the, the perfect mix for you and in, in that use case. Right. And to do that on the analog mixers, we used to have to tell people, well, okay, get a soldering iron, yes. go to this spot on the circuit board, <laughs> change that 600 ohm resistor to a, you know, 5000 ohm resistor or whatever. Or, or start tweaking those little dip switches. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it's much easier now to just say, well, I can try this. Do I like the sound of that? Mm, no, I liked it the other way. It's just checking and unchecking a box or, you know, changing a number in a menu. That's another great point in terms of ease of use for the customer. Right. right? Making it easier for the customer uh, to get what they need to get done with the product, huge leaps there as well. Right. So after the SCMA 20 digital automatic mixer, then um, we went in sort of a whole different direction Instead of saying, well, okay, here's a great mixer to use with whatever microphone, uh, we said, well, why shouldn't it be in the microphone? Yeah, right? <laughs> great question. Yeah. <laughs> why, why aren't the microphones smarter? Right. Why, why can't the microphone just take care of itself? Why is it always, you know, carrying around this box on a leash? Mm -hmm. Have you, right? Uh, so making the microphone smarter is, is kind of exactly what I was talking about when I was talking about that huge leap of the H20 and what, what turning that into a digital platform really allowed us to do with the rest of our uh, conferencing portfolio. Mm -hmm. right? having, having microphones that mix themselves. Who would have thought to do that? Right. It's <laughs> crazy because, talk. Be, because really when you come down to it, the customer does not think of 
the stages of this process. Like, well, the microphone captures the sound and you got eight of those or 16 of those. And then the mixer is combining all those things. It's just like, no, people are talking and somewhere there's a pipe that has the sound on it. Yep. And that's going <laughs> to plug into the internet or it's going to go to a loudspeaker or maybe it's going to go to a recorder. Yeah. And that's all they want to know. You know, there's the pipe with the, with the audio. And how it gets into that pipe, they really don't want to know. Right. Yeah. So, so the MX-A910, the, the ceiling ray has eight, you can think of lobes or like flashlights of audio pickup. You could steer around a three-dimensional space. Um, so it has eight, uh, we call them direct outs or kind of direct uh, outputs of those eight lobes. Uh, and there's a ninth channel out, out of the, the Dante output. That's the auto mix out of all those as well. So you can get both of those at the same time. So you can think about some interesting applications there in terms of uh, some sound reinforcement, some voice lift, as well as conferencing at mm -hmm. the same time, right? So kind of talking about uh, that presentation or electric kind of use case, you could always have that that professor or kind of main talent. Uh, you could have Cheryl up there, right? We always want Cheryl to get through. So we have that direct <laughs> output uh, always going out to the far end and then kind of that mix, whether that be uh, the audience, the, uh, the classroom, what have you. So there's kind of these interesting use cases where you can use both a single channel out as well as a mix out of all the microphones. And the MXA310, kind of similarly, the, the, the tabular microphone has four direct output channels and the fifth channel is that mix out. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can take the individuals, you can take the mix, you can use them both for different purposes, yep. you know, depending on the situation. So the idea is the microphone is moving away from, well, if it's this type of table in this type of room, you need this microphone. And now it's become sort of a a one microphone that can be programmed, if you will, to do whatever you want in whatever room. Yeah, we're, we're really trying to make uh, our microphones more flexible, trying to hit more use cases, trying to give um, kind of tools in, in, the, in the customer's tool belt, have you. Of I want to use it in this application. I'll use it in that application. You know, we're we're uh, you know working on these products for years, and we're thinking about all the use cases, all the applications. We put a product out, and in a couple months, these customers will figure out ways to use our products that we have never even thought of. We didn't even think about doing some of this stuff, and they're putting them in these applications, and they're being very successful with it. Uh, you know, so there's um, you know the uh, this application of voice lift, of being able to lift one side of the room to the other side of the room, right? You're in this massive ballroom type space, right? Think of like a hotel ballroom, right? If you're on one end of that ballroom and you're just talking, you can't really hear unless you're using some sound reinforcement, right? So right. instead of having uh, kind of passing a mic around or having these big, you know, uh, loudspeakers on sticks or something like that, there's this application called voice lift where it just lifts it a little bit. It lifts it so it's conversational. It almost lifts it to this to this slight amount where you don't really realize it's on. It's it's this interesting phenomenon where you're you're in this room and you're and you kind of see somebody down there and you're having this conversation you're like wow like I, you don't really think about it and then you turn off the system and then boom you can't hear them at all and you're like oh wow right this, this was very useful <laughs> yep yep and you know speaking as someone who is you know getting close to a certain age you know <laughs> there are times where if the room is a little noisy or it's a crowded you know training room or something like that somebody asks a question on the far end it can be difficult to hear and you know voice lift can really remedy that sure. but but in a way that's not so obvious right it, it makes it easy for for the end user in the room makes it easier for the sound guy makes it easier for for everybody right so then, of course, you've got some situations where you actually do need outboard processing. Yes. And so in 2018, we said, well, okay, we've, let's take Intellimix and even a little more and put it into an outboard DSP box that will work with whatever microphone solution you want, wired, wireless, goosenecks, lavaliers, you know, whatever it is. You know, you pick the solution. We've got a way to make it sound great. Yep. And this uh, th this step here, um, I would say, is just about as huge as that uh, SCMA 20 step in that it really broadened out the Intellimix brand and, and broadened out what Intellimix means uh, for us as well as our customers. Uh, so we, you know, uh, had Intellimix be uh, automatic mixing. And obviously for 35 years, it was automatic mixing, and that's what Intellimix was. Uh, but with the introduction of the P300, now it's a lot more than that, right? It means kind of all the AV conferencing DSP you would ever need, right? So how, how do you do AV conferencing in a room? You're going to need 
uh, to take care of echo. You're going to need to take care of noise. You're going to need to take care of automatic mixing. And we want to bring all that in under a sure brand of IntelliMix. So we actually, you know, for years have had these super smart DSP engineers, right? We had these DSP engineers uh, focused on wireless systems, right? All the uh, Axiant, ULXD, all these great wireless systems, all that big digital wireless kind of revolution right. that we've had in the past five or ten years. Uh, that is very heavily DSP based, right? These these guys are churning away those bits down there like you wouldn't believe, Chris. Uh, but th we, we decided to redirect some of those resources and say, why don't we do echo cancellation, right? We have, we have these smart guys. We could do this ourselves. So we tasked a couple guys to make one of the best echo cancellers on the market. Right? Mm -hmm. It's all homegrown algorithms. We didn't purchase this. We didn't buy a chip to do it. We didn't uh, you know, contract any of that out. These are sure engineers uh, making conferencing room DSP. Yep. Well, let's talk a little bit about what's what's in the nuts and bolts in some of these uh, solutions and, and when and how you can use them. So, for instance, you know, we like to say Intellimix solves your microphone problems. Sure does. And but that can those can take a lot of different forms depending on the scenario. So even if there's just one microphone in the room, as soon as you've got a couple of talkers, you've got a variety of things that might be happening. So let's talk about those. Uh, sure. Gain adjustment is is a simple fundamental one because you know you don't know the the distance from talker to microphone depends on the table and the room layout and so forth. You're going to have to adjust those levels. Yeah, you're also kind of going to have to adjust um, kind of what that downstream um, you know platform is kind of looking for, right? Whether it's a it's a software codec or a hardware codec, you're going to need to probably adjust some of that gain feeding that next stage. Right. So you're not just talking about the adjusting the level being fed from the microphone into a processor. You're talking about adjusting the output level being yep. sent onwards. Yep, exactly. So you've got independent controls for that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, gain structure of, of how you set your gains throughout the entire system. Uh, it's one of the most crucial aspects of making sure a, a room sounds good. Right. Now, what about parametric EQ? I mean, that's not something we typically say, uh, you know, oh, that's something you've got to do to make people sound good. Hopefully the microphone sounds good out of the box. Right. Well, you know, um, PEQ uh, is really made to kind of shape or kind of uh, kind of signal condition um, the, the room. If there's a weird resonance in the room, if there's a weird buzz or hum or something in the room, you can kind of shape some of that out with some with some filtering. So you're basically uh, you know, amplifying or uh, decreasing the level of certain frequency points in that room. Right. You right. also have low and high pass filters. So if right. you've got a room that's got a lot of low frequency rumble, maybe you just want to kind of get rid of everything below a certain frequency to get rid of that. Exactly. You know, if it's like a, a private executive's room or something, they have a particularly boomy voice or a particularly high pitched voice. They can kind of, uh, you know, shape that a bit. We all don't have the, the buttery smooth voice that <laughs> that you have, Chris. I eat butter before oh, each wow. webinar. That's, that's yes. your secret. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Um, then a compressor limiter. This is kind of related to the the booming voice that you mentioned. You know, you've bit, got yeah. some people that tend to be loud talkers. You yeah, know, I'm so, certainly one of them. So the, so the compressor is really used to limit the dynamic range of, of, of a signal. And the limiter is really meant to uh, prevent your signal from going above a certain threshold. So, uh, you know, if, if you get uh, very angry or if you start throwing around some, some laptops or some books, you won't blow out your speakers. Um, and then related to that is automatic gain control, which is sort of like the invisible hand of the sound engineer on the fader. Yeah, this this one's pretty cool, and it kind of goes hand in hand with the automatic mixer in that it's really trying to uh, get a consistent level for each talker in the room. All right, so so this actually adapts over a handful of seconds. And if uh, you know you, you you've all been in this meeting where where someone's really loud, someone's really quiet, and on on the far end of that call, you're kind of uh, you know herky-jerky between these two gears of, oh my god this guy's too loud or oh my oh, oh my like, i need to turn this way up um so that's really meant to uh make things more consistent between participants in the in the, the same call and then finally noise reduction this this was like the holy grail for a long time because people would go through all kinds of gyrations to try to reduce the pickup of room noise in an analog system and in the digital domain it's a lot easier yeah this one's really cool this one's really meant to uh, eliminate kind of wide band noise sources you can think static noises white noise type type uh, noise sources things like hvac fans projector fans 
And there is a ton of math and physics behind this thing, right? This is, you know, a little bit out of your depth, Chris, in terms of, of how far we're going into, into the, uh, the tech notes. But there's really smart guys working on this, and it's really cool how they can eliminate all these kind of noises without interfering with your voice signal. It's pretty remarkable. And when you hear a demo of it, yeah, it's, it's cool. like you think, well, you know, the room sounds great. I don't really hear any noise reduction happening. And then you turn it off, and it's there like, oh, wow, I didn't know how much was there until you turned it off. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, we we actually do a great demo at uh, trade shows, actually, with this noise reduction, and you can actually uh, kind of hear the, the 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 hum and the buzz and the, all the chatter of, of of the of the trade show floor kind of collapse as soon as you turn it on. It's 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 very cool. Right. Yep. And ideally, if you're lucky, your room is quiet enough that it doesn't need this. Correct. But if if you do, it's there, and it's as simple as a click of the mouse to enable it. Um, so those are things you might use even if you've got one microphone. As soon as you've got multiple microphones, now the Intellimix automatic mixing is is obviously a, a key player here. And yep. it's doing all those things about activating which microphone or which lobe, depending on, you know, the type of microphone that you've got, um, you know, and how many of them you've got. Um, so we've already kind of discussed that. But it's, it's still allowing you to... Um, Make those selections as to does one mic have priority over another? Um, is there a certain mic that I want to be live all the time or something like that? Yeah, there's definitely some some settings you could tweak. Uh, but but again, like we've seen this to be really the, the linchpin of how good a conference room sounds, right? If if you're putting multiple microphones into a conference room and your automatic mixer is not performing, you are throwing away a bunch of that investment in that room. You're you're not going to be happy with those results if the automatic mixer is not operating properly. Right. Because if you've got too many open mics when you should just have one, yep. or if you've got the wrong one open. Even worse. Even worse, because then somebody's saying, can you hear me? And it's like, well, yeah, kind of, sort of, but you sound like you're... Distant. Uh, yeah, you're yeah. on the other side of the room or something. Right. So that decision's got to be made you know, accurately every time. Um, and then when you've got, as soon as you get into a video conferencing situation where now you've got microphones and speakers interacting with each other, although uh, not the live mics feeding the live loudspeaker directly, but it becomes more of a, a two-way, two-location phenomenon. Yeah. Um, echo cancellation, um, I, I, I like to say it's really an enabling technology, meaning that without uh, AEC, um, a call couldn't happen. It just frankly wouldn't work. Um, so so there, there's this phenomenon, and I'm sure everyone has experienced it, where you kind of hear yourself back after a half a second or a second. Uh, it can sometimes happen on if you have a poor cell service or you're in a bad conference call, and, and you just hear yourself, uh, everything you're saying, kind of just repeat it back to you shortly after you say it, and it's so jarring. Like it, it just breaks how your how your brain is trying to communicate. Right. Um, and and it's, it's uh, you know, so it's kind of, AC is kind of inherent in a lot of um, communication platforms, but how it's done uh, is really the important part. Right, because echo cancelers, uh, you know, they've been around for many years right. and they've evolved incredibly, yep. uh, you know, but used to require extensive training and adjustment and tweaking. Uh, and even then, it was kind of a dicey process, you know, to make it work really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was never totally transparent. But we've gotten to the point now where it's like noise reduction. You don't really realize it's there until you shut it off. Right. And it, it's also one of, those, one of those pieces of technology that enables you to have kind of a, a normal conversation. And again, you don't have to uh, wait for that other person to finish talking and then you politely uh, speak after that. It, it allows you to interrupt someone on the other end of the call. It allows you to hear them. It allows you to uh, have this very natural communication. Now, what about matrix mixing? That's not something that a lot of people would immediately jump to as, oh, I'm going to need matrix mixing. Right. How would I use that <laughs> in a video conferencing uh, situation? Sure. So, so, so the matrix mixer uh, allows you to send any input of the DSP to any output of the DSP. So you can think about um, how it allows you to route signals around to either different speakers, different uh, codecs, or different uh, platforms. It can, you could send, uh, you know, an, an output to a, to an amplifier. Or you could send an output to a recorder. You know, it just gives you a lot of flexibility 
for your use case and your application. It allows you to uh, almost do a couple things at once. Have mm -hmm. you, right? If, if uh, back to this kind of lecture use case, if you want to uh, have uh, distance learning, but also record the lecture, you could send feeds to different places uh, and so forth. So it's basically uh, just a big kind of traffic controller you could think of in, in the middle. It's saying, all right, you signal go there, you signal go there, and uh, you could send the same signal to multiple places. Uh, it really is just all about flexibility. Right. And of course, you've got level controls at each of those, for each of those destinations. That's not a great point. Uh, depending upon what that kind of out, outbound uh, signal is going to, you can change the level at each of those points. Right. Right. So if you've got the system tied into a PC and an amplifier and those need drastically different levels, you've got the ability to do that. So in, yep. in Telemix is sort of trying to, to mastermind the whole thing, basically. Um, let's see. Let's talk about. Oh, so we've talked a little bit about you know sort of the concept of IntelliMix. So you can get it in a couple different places. We've been talking about the MXA nine ten, and this is really a relatively recent thing that the full enchilada of IntelliMix has been built into the nine ten. Right? That just occurred recently. Yeah, and uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm uh, kicking myself for using the word huge earlier because I don't know what's what's bigger than this. Mm -hmm. um, Having a, a microphone that not only mixes itself, but you get an echo-free, noise-free output. This is a uh, professional, you know, microphone conference room in a box. It, it takes care of everything that downstream box used to do for you, and it's all off of one wire. It's uh, remarkable. Yeah, and I remember when people were using rollabout video conferencing carts, Ooh. rollabout <laughs> systems, <laughs> Basically, all the audio stuff that was in the bottom half of that cart yep. is now in the microphone. Yeah, this this is a, a sea change in terms of technology, in terms of innovation. Uh, having echo cancellation, noise reduction built into an array microphone is a, is a big deal. So if you need some specific microphone or multiple mics or desk mics or whatever your you know preferred flavor is, you can also get all this in a DSP box that can go under the table or in a rack or wherever you want to put it um, in the P300. Um, and the P300 actually gives you a, a little bit more horsepower in a couple of areas. Yeah, so, um, you know, there, there is, I guess, a little bit of uh, potential confusion around, well, if I have a 910 with all the DSP built in, why do I need the P300? And uh, first of all, right, not, not every microphone is the superstar that the 910 is, right? So, for example, MXA310, doesn't have all that DSP built in. The MXW series are all the analog microphones you could use with the P300. So using different microphone types, uh, we see very often two or three MXA310 table arrays on a, on a big conference room table. You would need the P300 there. Uh, but also, how do you um, get multiple 910s in the same room talking to each other as well? Right. Right. So each, you know, an, an MXA910 is basically capable of taking care of itself these days. You know, but the P300 is taking care of everybody. Right? It brings 910s together, it brings the whole microphone portfolio together, uh, gives you connectivity uh, to both uh, hardware and software video codecs. So there's analog outputs, there's USB outputs, there's actually a mobile connector on there too, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think we might have, well, here's sort of a layout. So this is what's going on inside. And I love this view because for the, the technicians in the audience, this really is sort of what they want to see. Like, how many gazintism comes out as, as, yep. mm -hmm. as a broadcaster used to say to me. Um, so this is sort of the, the inside schematic map of the, of the P300 and what you can put in and get out of it, thanks to uh, the Dante interface there. But you've got analog, you've got Dante inputs, you've got USB to connect directly to a PC, you've got your matrix mixer and so forth. And of course, any one of those blocks you can enable, disable, or click on and open up and manipulate the settings. Exactly, exactly. So this is what we refer to as a fixed architecture DSP as opposed to an open architecture DSP. And there's obviously trade-offs, right? There's plus and minuses. Uh, and it's kind of you're on this continuum of flexibility versus simplicity. And we we think that you know this the simple approach uh, to DSP is, is a bit better for these applications. So the P three hundred was kind of laser focused on medium sized uh, video conference rooms. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have the, the USB output for this explosion in software video conferencing. Right, I, I think most people would agree that uh, the majority of their rooms going in these days are video enabled. Right, and and the vast majority of that is done with a with a USB connector 
uh, to some sort of software codec, whether that's uh, Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Blue Jeans or GoToMeeting, what have you, WebEx. Um, so having kind of a simple DSP approach that works in all those rooms was kind of our main goal. Our main goal is to have a DSP easy button uh, for our microphones to connect to the rest of those systems. Um, so speaking of connections, so here's sort of the layout of, of how this all might go together here. You've got your MXA 910, you know, mounted over the table. You've got a, uh, an Ethernet switch there to tie all these things together. You could have your P300 there. Um, program audio from something else, tie into your video conference system, uh, connect to a PC if you're doing a soft codec. Um, and that's an important choice now, isn't it? Because a lot of rooms are going one way or the other, sometimes both. Yeah, and um, you know, it, it seems like that choice is being made a lot more by the IT department than the AV department, mm. right? Uh, so and it may change over time. It can, it can, right? So, so, so the IT department's really standardizing on a communications platform. Right. Like I said, there's there's some big vendors out there and uh, those vendors kind of uh, start uh, kind of uh, diverging paths between software where you're going to be connecting USB to either an in-room PC or some type, some type of uh, kind of PC based appliance that is hosting that software codec. Or you're going to be moving uh, to kind of a hardware codec, which when you're going to be using those analogs, uh, the in and outs and you know, the popular ones are Cisco, Polycom, so forth, uh, where you could use those those analog connectors. So kind of being flexible to both of those architectures is, is important. Right. Uh, we've even got a connector on the P300s. So you can tie in a mobile phone if you want to use that as your gateway. Uh, and then, of course, outputs to loudspeakers, and you can use expansion boxes to get more ins and outputs if you've you know, got a, a larger scale system. But the idea is this thing is the, like you said, the, the easy button, the one-stop yep. shop. And if you move from brand X uh, codec this year to brand Y codec next uh, codec next year, um, the P300 is ready to do it. Yeah, and I think this this diagram points out something cool that um, I guess I didn't discuss was that the this, the physical size of the P300 was a big uh, factor in its uh, design. Right, so the P300 is actually a a half rack box. It's small. It's PoE powered. Uh, the goal of it was to have it. Uh, kind of be mounted behind a display, uh, underneath a table. We didn't want to have a rack in the room. We, right. With all these architecture changes where we were talking about how the facilities is, is designing the room for us, they, they don't leave space for gear. They yeah. don't leave space for racks. Yeah, they there's no equipment stuff. closet exactly. anymore. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So so being able to have this kind of flexible installation was important to us. So there's not that many physical connectors, but you can see uh, we have additional network-based Dante input in the, inputs and outputs. So you can send um, more audio channels over the network to one of our A&I or audio network interface boxes if you need more inputs or outputs. So the bottom line is that Regardless of what your conferencing ecosystem is, uh, what brand, what type, what format, what technology, um, we've kind of got the front end covered for you where Intellimix gives you the way to make microphones sound great, whether it's built into the microphone or whether it's a box that works with your chosen microphones, um, we've got a, a solution that works. And a lot of integrators have told us, you know, this is sort of my standard go-to choice. Yep. You know, it doesn't really matter if it's, you know, just a an eight an eight seat conference table in a very run of the mill conference room, or it's a complicated training room with 120 people and three presenters, and I need a combination of wireless body packs and you know everything. We've got a scenario that works. Um, Cheryl, what about uh, some questions here? Do people have is there anything more they could possibly want to know? Uh, apparently not, because we don't have any questions no just questions. yet. Yeah, you guys were super thorough. But if you do have a question and you're holding on it, please go ahead and type it in right now. We've got two great experts in the room, as you can uh, tell. Well, while, while we have some time, can you go back a slide? Mm -hmm. um, there was yep. something cool on there that we didn't really talk about was uh, Zoom. Right? So, yes. so we're actually uh, Zoom certified. Uh -huh. uh, we're the first and only professional DSP that's certified for use with Zoom rooms. Uh, and that gives us a couple cool things, right? It, it allows us to do uh, a feature we call mute sync, right? So, so mute sync. Remember, you're talking about that that logic. Yes. Right, right back with the systems. You, you would press a button, and you know, mm -hmm. change the LED and stuff for you. Well, we brought that uh, into the modern age uh, with Zoom. Uh, you, you you make a couple clicks 
um, on our DSP. So you basically uh, do one click on the P300 that says enable logic. It's it's very complicated. I mean, <laughs> you could do this, Chris. Even I right. could do it, yes. Uh, so you, you click enable logic, and then uh, with, with the 910, you do nothing. Uh, with the 310, you have to go uh, and make it, maybe it's two clicks. So you change the button mode from local uh, to logic, and you're done. Uh -huh. Now you plug in your USB cable to, to the Zoom Room PC, and every time you touch the button on the microphone or you hit mute on Zoom, it all stays in sync. Right. So your LEDs or your microphone, your on-screen notification of Zoom mute, all stays in sync, and that was the full set of procedure I went through. A <laughs> couple clicks, plug in USB, you're done. I mean, and you, you would need an expensive control system to do that before. Right, and you might not think right away that that's so important, except... People are concerned about privacy in Huge. meetings now, mm -hmm. and so it's important to know that is the system muted or isn't it? And oh, yeah. if I see a red light or a green light on the microphone, does that mean the microphone's muted or does that mean the whole system's muted? Right. You know, I, I need a, a confirmed sense of security and confidence yep. that I know what's the status of this thing. So the fact that whether you mute it on your laptop or you mute it at the microphone, it's all coordinated. Exactly, exactly. And how you do that is even more important. So if you just mute at the microphone before the DSP, for example, uh, you're going to get in some trouble when you unmute that microphone, right? These echo cancelers, these noise reducers, uh, the, the automatic mixing algorithms are still constantly running. And if you start giving that a hard mute, the kind of digital zeros or just dead air into those algorithms, when you unmute again, they're going to take some time a few seconds to kind of get back to where they are in space have you what's what's in that room what am i expecting um so if you so when when we do it you uh, basically hit the button on the microphone and it doesn't mute at the microphone the audio is still running to, to the p300 and it mutes at a later stage in the p300 so that echo cancellator uh, echo canceller stays converged the noise reducer is still hearing audio the automatic mixer is still figuring out noise floors and what microphones to turn on it's just not going out to zoom Okay, we have some questions oh, now. Wow. Yes, the, the, that was the great. Mute sync did it, huh? The mute sync did it. Okay, question number one, a pretty pretty basic MXA nine ten question. How many MXA nine ten can I use in one room? Wow, um, as many as you want. Uh, so um, <laughs> every ceiling tile in MXA nine ten. We, we see applications with uh, over ten in in a room. Uh, I don't know the the maximum amount, but I know. Um, you know, one thing that's very common, uh, a, a large financial company uh, in the UK, I know, uses about four in every one of their big uh, kind of training rooms. So they have a bunch of these training rooms. They have about one per floor, and they use about four. Uh, there's a big uh, company in the U.S. that has about nine or ten in each of their kind of multi-purpose type spaces. Uh, so really, it, it um, it's up to uh, the, the, the room size, how much audio coverage do you need, and um, it, it has a lot to do with the physical space. Right. So the each of the 910s would be presumably set to auto mixer mode, yep. and there'd be one output from each mic. And yep. then some downstream mixer or processor would be collecting those and exactly. either selecting the right one or activating them all or whatever, depending on how you have that set up. Exactly. Okay. The next question, believe it or not, is actually for me. <laughs> what is the microphone system you are using right now? Um, so we're kind of using a little bit of a different hybridized, more broadcast style system. We're not using our room system. Um, we're pretty lucky that the space that we're in is, is fairly quiet, um, so we actually don't have any Intellimix running um, or auto mixing running right now. Um, but what we are using is um, on the microphone end, we're using KSM-8s, which are our great dual dyne um, microphones. If you don't know anything about them, they are a great vocal and performance mic and also work pretty well for broadcast as you can tell. And then we have those plugged into an Annie 4-in, uh, and then that Annie 4-in is connected to an Annie USB matrix, which is going into my computer. So pretty, uh, sort of a different a different setup here, um, but it's it's been working really well for us. So kind of uh, analog mics to, to Dante networked mm -hmm. uh, to USB. Exactly. Right. How we're going. Exactly. I don't think that's a typical way people would do it, but it's what we've been using, and it's working pretty well. So. Okay, next question. Um, do you need a PoE switch? Great question. Uh, yes, so all of our uh, MXA microphones, our P300, our Annie, 
uh, boxes, our MXW system, are all PoE powered. Uh, the P300 is actually PoE plus, which means it takes a little more wattage than, than the other guys. Uh, but uh, the, the benefit of that is basically there's one cable to all these devices, and it provides uh, power, you get audio over that cable, and you get control over that cable. So it really simplifies the installation. You're not, uh, you know, uh, trying to wire up eight or 12 different outputs uh, in the back of a rack, and you're all, you know, like a mechanic underneath the car, like, <laughs> all going crazy, uh, trying to figure out all, where all these cables are going and where they're coming from. Uh, it's, it's really simplifying the whole thing. Great. All right. Is the mute sync accomplished through the P300 USB connection? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, exactly. So that's all done over USB. Uh, and there's no uh, settings on the USB side of the PC or in Zoom that you have to do. Uh, you just basically plug it in and it automatically knows uh, to do the handshake and, and start signaling. Great. Um, the practice for the MXA910A indicates setting the gain for each lobe to Unity. Wouldn't you want to set the gains based on the individual IDs at each lobe? Individual IDs. Or Ds, it says. Individual Ds. Individual Ds. Maybe distance? Maybe distance. Uh, so what, what we recommend when we're uh, connecting the MXA uh, 910 to the P300 is to do all your DSP in oh, the DSP. Oh, wait. D, D sub S. The distance from oh. the source to the microphone. There you go. Ah, there Not D's, D sub S. D sub there S. it is. I remember, <laughs> that's a real engineer. Who, who I remember that my PAG equation. Pag nag. Yep. Yeah. So, um, you know, when when you're connecting the 910, like I said, directly to, to the P300, we, we expect you to or encourage you uh, to do your filtering, your gain structure, all of that at the DSP and kind of give uh, the raw signals to, to the P300. Uh, next question is for me once again. Are you going to send us this presentation? Um, we won't be spending out the slides, but as I mentioned, a recorded version will be available in about a week or so at shore.com slash webinars. Shore.com slash webinars. Okay, next question. What kind of speakers can you connect straight to the P300? Eight ohms? Question mark? No, you're going to need an amp. Yeah, the answer is none. <laughs> it's not a powered. It's not a powered output Correct. for loudspeakers. It's just a line level audio output that Correct. goes to your power amp the, or powered loudspeaker. The analog outputs of the B three hundred are just line level. Uh, there are some Dante enabled speakers on the market, so we do have the the, the Dante outputs of the P three hundred, which makes uh, you know your life a little simpler. They are more expensive than analog microphones, but you don't have to worry about buying an amp. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, going back to the network switches question, what type of network switches should I use for the MXA910 microphone and P300 configuration? That's Actually, remember <laughs> Joel Norris and I did a webinar about, what, nine months or a year ago where we talked about that, I think, and about the importance of using managed switches mm -hmm. where you can control the settings. Um, you know, you don't want to use a green switch that right. goes into... Eco mode, Ethernet. yeah, you and shuts ports that. off and things like that. You want a switch that you can control, you can manage the ports and the settings for it. Um, so we recommend gigabit speeds. Yeah, a gigabit switch, definitely. Yeah, and I believe uh, if you look on our FAQ section on our website, I believe there's a question that details this and might even mention some specific brands and models. Yeah, I know um, Audinate, I think, has a list of switches as well. Yes. And all of our devices are completely Audinate and Dante compliant, so we just kind of dovetail on whatever networking requirements they have. Um, it, it becomes quite cumbersome for us to uh, keep a list of switches and firmwares and so forth, so um, it's, it's, it's a bit just too much housekeeping and overhead for us to constantly... Uh, be updating a, a list of known switches. But right. uh, we have a, a myriad of brands that we test with in-house. You know, uh, if you look on everyone's desk, there's there's uh, a handful of different manufacturers. So uh, as long as they meet certain kind of core criteria, they're going to they're gonna mostly work. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, next question. How many Dante channels can be utilized from numerous auto-mixed mic arrays, 310s and 910s, and still be handled by the P300? So that, uh, I guess, just matters... Um, I guess it's all eight, right? The, the P300 has eight uh, inputs from that automatic mixer, so you could send um, it to all eight. Yeah, so you could send eight MXA310s or yep. eight 910s or whatever. Yeah. And uh, the, the only thing that I guess I'd caution there is once you get into that size of room, I, 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 most people are going to be trying to do more than the P300 
uh, can really allow you to do. So as I said, uh, the P3 engine was kind of laser focused on these medium sized kind of video conference spaces. When you start trying to do uh, some of those more complicated use cases, you're going to need a little bit more custom routing, uh, a little more customization that DSP probably. Uh, so, you know, um, they once you're at a, an 8, 9, 10 room, you might be uh, out uh, classing the P300 heavy. Great. Okay. Are there plans for Mute Sync on Microsoft Teams? Great question. Uh, yes, there are. Uh, so we are, um, you know, the, the MXA 910 is uh, Microsoft certified. And actually, Mute Sync does work with Teams today. Uh, so the P300 does not have official uh, Microsoft Teams certification. However, Mute Sync does work. Great. Okay, next question. Um, is there third-party control available for the system via Crestron or QSIS? And will there be a QSIS plugins available at some point down the line? Great question again. So there are uh, third-party control strings, we call them, or it's just kind of like a, like a little API. It's uh, TCP IP commands that you send to the IP address of the MXA or the P300, and you can control basically everything. So you could say, uh, you know, P300, turn your gain up, uh, you know, on channel one, so you could have a little control panel, a Crestron panel um, in, in the room to do that. And that's also how you can accomplish some of that uh, camera control we were talking about. So the automatic mixer uh, actually can uh, output a little uh, kind of ping saying, you know, channel one just gated on or channel two just gated on. So your uh, camera control system can kind of subscribe to those commands. And whenever a new channel is gated on, uh, you can kind of get an indication of where to point your camera. Okay, next question. Um, okay, this one, I'm not quite sure what they're asking, so I'm just going to ask it as it's typed, and you guys best. might be able to figure yes. it out. Uh, what about in the slice label, connect however you want? It, is it an output label? It, wait, it is an output label speaker. Could you explain this? So I think on the slide where we had a speaker maybe coming uh, out of... Ah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, yep. I see. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah, so I think the assumption here, um, well, either there's that little triangle, which could be an amplifier. Right. Or um, or we're just kind of assuming oh, yeah. those are powered loudspeakers. we're assuming those are powered. Yes. Yep. All right. All right. Next question. If we are using multiple MXA910, what is the best practice to set up each lobe separately or to use Automax? Ah, so, um, well, there there is the, um, I believe it's called the auto position is the feature in the MXA910, uh, which is very cool. So basically, um, you can kind of sit where you, where you want a lobe to go, uh, highlight that lobe, click auto position, talk for a couple seconds, and that lobe is just kind of, you know, steered right on you. Uh, it's pretty cool. So that's a way to kind of get a room uh, up and running quite easily. I think we, we would recommend to kind of start there. You could either start with the, with a template of coverage uh, or you could start with uh, that kind of auto position. Um, and we also have this new technology called autofocus, which makes it even better, right? So so the autofocus really tries to maximize your signal to noise ratio of, of, of that lobe. And it'll actually kind of swing maybe a foot or two initial position. Uh, it won't kind of swing to the other end of the room or what have you. No, um, but if I roll my chair a little to one side or I lean back. You were talking about that earlier. About yeah. Poor meeting etiquette, leaning back. Exactly. Moving around. Right. Poor etiquette, maybe, but but normal. Normal. So, exactly. you know, the mic will, will adjust for that and say, exactly. oh, you move back a little. That's okay. Yeah. And, and that autofocus technology is really trying to compensate for some of those kind of conference room behaviors, meeting room culture type behavior uh, that gets you in a bad audio spot. Right. And, and then the, the key thing about that, that lobe not moving more than a foot or two is it really lets you define where you don't want audio coverage. Mm. Right. It's 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 defining where you want audio coverage and defines where you don't want it. Maybe more important. Right. right. You don't wanna... Because it won't move more than a couple feet to either exactly. side. Exactly. You don't you don't want to mic uh, the, the, the door. You don't want to mic that buffet table of, of food and such. Right. Right. And so it really gives you a lot of control. Awesome. Uh, does it make any difference if two lobes from two different MXA910 overlap a little bit? Not with our auto mixer. Um, so it depends on what your application is kind of downstream. If you're sending those direct outputs to the same spot and you have one talker in both of those lobes, you, you might hear a little bit of, of funkiness. Maybe there might be some comb filtering or something going on uh, if you're trying to just uh, kind of wet dry mix those 
but if you're using uh, an Intellimix automatic mixer, you will have no problem at all. Because it'll it'll evaluate those two feeds and it'll pick one. Exactly. Even if they're both essentially interchangeable and equally good, it'll just say, well, I'm just using this one. Exactly. Because so I don't have, need to. We have a feature called Max Bus. I, I believe that name probably came from 30 years ago because it doesn't mean as much today, Max Bus, as it does uh, maybe back then. But it will only turn on one channel for one sound source. Right. All right. I'm going to take this next one. Uh, any chance of a share brand branded PoE Dante loudspeaker that is the same form vector and look as the MXA 910A? 2x2 two two tile replacement would be very helpful. Thanks. And I'm going to say, as a private company, we don't actually discuss our future product plans or roadmap, um, but I can tell you we are always working very hard behind the scenes to expand and improve our product lines along with the technologies of today. So sorry to have to give you the super PR um, answer to that, but thank you for the suggestion, and um, I'm sure the product teams will will be alerted to that, but we can't really talk about what we're working on. All right, next question. Um, can I – oh, by the way, we're a little long, so I hope everybody doesn't mind. We're a few minutes over here. Um, so I hope – you can wait on lunch just a few more minutes and we'll get through these. Um, can I use multiple MXA 910 for voice lift and video conferencing? Yes. Sure. Yeah. People are, people are doing that where they've, they got, sure they've got a room that's <laughs> set up for video conferencing and they've got maybe two zones or four zones in the room and they're doing a little bit of voice lift from one zone to the other as well as feeding all those zones out to the video conference. Exactly. So we have a, an actual training room uh, in this building here, right, a couple doors down, that's doing that exact thing, right? It's kind of lifting uh, one side of the room to the other, and both of those are kind of mixed together to go out to the far end. Exactly. So, you know, that that is really where the, the networked audio aspect of this really gives you that flexibility. You know, it lets you just route channels wherever you need them to go. It allows you to send multiple of those channels um, elsewhere. You know, can, you can have like a one-to-many type of routing. So you, you can really have a lot of flexibility in your install. Great. Uh, which form, firmware version of the MXA not or excuse, of the MXA 910 has autofocus? It's the latest one on the website. I don't remember the numbers. I think it starts with a three. <laughs> yes, it was three point something, <laughs> but point I something. I can't remember the number. One five? One six? Something along those lines. It's it's um it's the latest one on on the website. Right. Great. And that was released, I believe, in uh, June of 2019. All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask this last question, and it's for me, so I'll take care of it. Um, can someone high-five Chris for me now? I used to sit on the other side of the cubicle wall from him in Niles. <laughs> Signed, Triffin. Triffin, So yeah. here's a high-five. <laughs> hey, Trippin, how you doing? <laughs> All righty. All right. Oh, one more late-breaking question. Um, what should be the room size for voice lift? Um, that's an interesting question, and uh, it, it can kind of – we can meander on this for maybe a while. <laughs> I don't know if anybody wants to eat lunch or not. Uh, <laughs> but it's almost um, – there are rooms that are too small for it. I was going to so, say there's a certain minimum size, and I, yes. I want to say that we were talking about – 20 to 24 feet or bigger? Well, yeah, a lot goes into kind of that pag-nag. Yeah, over, right. right? Uh, and also kind of the uh, just the inherent latency of uh, one millisecond per foot, right, of, of just sound propagation through air. Um, there's there's uh, quite a bit that goes into it, and it's almost like the, there are no rooms that are too big for voice lift, but there are rooms that are not big enough right. for voice lift, right? Because if you start hearing... The direct sound from my voice, as well as the voice lift uh, copy of my voice coming out of the speaker. If you're hearing both of those at reasonably the same volume, it's going to start sounding off. It's mm -hmm. going to start sounding either a little reverby, a little, a little uh, comb filtered. Um, so you, you basically want to make sure that your room is big enough for it. Right. Didn't we have a blog post about this? There is one. A few months ago. I think there's some sort of white paper-ish type FAQ. I type think on the document. Sure Ignite blog, I believe there that Troy Jensen maybe have maybe uh, might have authored. Great. 
All right. We got through all the questions. So thanks for sticking around, gents. Um, if you do have any other questions that you are too shy to type or that crop into your head later um, about Intellimix or about any other sort of audio question, you can always email those to support at sure.com. We have a great team of guys and gals on, on that gr- in that group that can answer so many questions. So please feel free to reach out with them to them with any audio questions. That's support at sure.com. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you learned a little something. I know I sure did. And I hope to see you on the next one. Have a great day. Done.